So let me start off by welcoming you all to this presentation to introduce antenna-based calibration. So after careful flagging of our observational data to remove most, if not all, of the bad data, we can start processing the data and apply the first calibration steps presented here. From our knowledge of radio telescopes, we know that interferometer arrays measure the complex visibilities of the source, and the basic need for calibration is thus to correct the measured visibilities will be to approximate as closely as possible the true visibilities here represented by X. Consequently, calibration is an important part of radio astronomy data processing, and dedicated observations of calibrated sources must be included in the observation preparation and time request in your proposal. The key point of planning and including calibration targets is that if the observation cannot be properly calibrated, the science goal cannot be achieved. The best calibration sources are generally well characterized and usually unresolved or point-like sources. We utilize the known characteristics, as well as the signal properties, of these calibrated sources to measure and remove the effects of residual phases added by the instrument and atmosphere to our observed data. While calibrators with known flux or power also allow us to measure the flux of our sources in the observed data. Various calibrator solutions exist, but the most common are gain or phase calibration, which requires a point-like source close to the target, bandpass calibrators, which requires a strong calibrator source with a known spectrum, and then obviously our flux calibrators, which requires a calibrator with a known flux. Correcting the measured visibilities to obtain our true visibilities is an, in essence an optimization strategy with the main purpose to remove insofar as possible the effects of instrumental and atmospheric factors in the measurements. In this presentation, we will start with a quick recap how interferometry works to explain the purpose and the of the various calibrations, followed by an introduction to the basics of radio astronomy calibration concepts and procedures. We will closing off with some practical examples to demonstrate the basic methodology when calibrating your data. So let's start with a hunt for angular resolution. The resolving power of a telescope is the ability to separate objects that are located at a small angular distance. Thus, angular resolution describes the ability of radio telescopes to distinguish small details of a larger structure and is limited by the size of the interference fringes. The physical size of a single telescope limits the spatial resolution of the object that can be resolved but astronomy in general needs high resolution to observe the vast range of astrophysical phenomena. Thus, we need to extend this limit set by our single telescopes, and the solution is a technical problem, which is called interferometry. In its most basic form, interferometry involves the simultaneous projection of all the signals of a number of single telescopes, or antenna, onto the same image plane, as if the smaller telescopes or antenna were all part of one huge telescope. If this is done in such a way that the signals from each of the antenna arrives at the image plane exactly at the same time, the beams from all the locations can be combined to produce a single synthesized beam. And this beam has an angular size that is much smaller to the beams than any of the single telescopes and therefore enhancing the telescope's ability to resolve smaller sources. The Meerkat interferometer measures the correlated output of each pair of dish aperture antennas to produce a series of complex interference patterns of the two slowly varying voltages from the antennas. These interference patterns, or called fringes, can be regarded as the real and imaginary part of a set of measurements of the complex visibility function where the complex visibility function in term is simply the cross-correlation measuring the coherence of a signal as a function of spacing between the pairs of antennas. As more of these fringe patterns are combined electronically through correlation, the fringe pattern becomes more concentrated and starts to resemble the point spread function of PSF of a single large telescope. 
We thus obtain the synthesized beam representing the telescope's PSF, measured as the Fourier transform showing a flat aperture-like diffraction pattern. The PSF of this synthesized beam is much narrower with higher angular scale than that of the PSF of any of the single dishes. In the path between the source and the correlator, a number of intentional and spurious transformations occur, which means the signal you measure, the visibility's V, is distorted through interstellar, atmospheric and instrumental effects that corrupts the signal from your target of interest. In general, these distortions can be described as rotations and translations that is applied to the signal component as the signal travels along the line of sight towards the telescope. Consequently, the relation between the measured and actual visibilities can be considered as linear, which means the introduced distortions can be described by parameters representing a complex antenna gain factor, here classified as G, plus an additive noise term, ER, which comes from the amplitude and phase errors that, scatter, that scatters powers across the, the image, resulting in more noisy images. Both contributors must be calibrated for all interferometer measurements, and these gain calibration solutions are obtained by measuring our calibrator sources as frequently as possible, followed by matrix calculation that determine the correction through linear interpolation. Going deeper into the details, we see that for each interferometer measurement, we have to correct the measured visibilities in order to obtain our best approximation of the true visibilities. And for each measurement, we thus have to apply the correction equation. Thus, each one of these corrections requires us to solve a linear relation to obtain both amplitude and phase differences describing the per antenna complex gain factors at each given time, as well as the additive noise factor representing the power scatter across the image due to the phase and amplitude errors. To simplify our notation, we fall back on the fact that each visibility is simply the time average cross-correlation product of the total field measured at any two antennas in our array and the time um, delay applied between them. So we obtain the, the matrix V with XX, XY, YX and YY. And these cross-correlation products can then be described in a matrix notation, which is conveniently compact. And the matrix notation we will define as per antenna Jones matrices, describing the many effects of the signal as it propagates from source to correlator. And the combined Jones matrix can then simply be the product of the per antenna Jones matrices. Which ultimately brings us to the radio interferometry measurement equation, or RIME, which we'll discuss in the next slide. This fundamental equation seeks to fully describe the signal along its travel path and therefore relates the observed visibilities to our true visibilities. The full radio interferometer measurement equation consists of a number of matrices describing both the impact and the order of each distortion onto the signal. The letters representing each matrix term are often chosen to conform to certain conventions used in data calibration packages, such as G for gain, B for bandpass, D for polarization leakage, and F for Faraday rotation. In general, the matrices presented here are the Faraday rotation, when one polarization is delayed with respect to the other, which causes a phase shift, followed by a parallactic angle, which is due to changes in the orientation of the sky in the telescope's point of view, which rotates the target position angle, but typically we know this analytically. Then next important is the instrumental polarization, which is an off-diagonal matrix describing the leakage between what we assume to be orthogonal polarization channels. We have complex gain, which is sort of a catch-all for most amplitude and phase errors introduced by our antenna electronics. Then we have a bandpass response, which describes the frequency dependence of antenna electronics, followed by our geometric and fractional delay correction, which is errors that is corrected that corrects the fringe rotation and thereby position our target on the sky in the phase center. We will focus this presentation 
in the, on the most common calibration correction matrices, which is going to be our delay, our band pass, and our gain corrections. Using observational data of representative calibrator sources, the occasional calibration solution is computed as the relation between the observed visibility and some known visibility model for our calibrator. The calibration process starts with antenna-based calibration to correct for time and frequency independent effects. During the calibration process, the respective antenna-based calibration solutions are calculated for these known models and the solutions in the end is transferred to the science source before analysis. Fundamental to calibration will always be the correction of phases over time through gain calibration, the normalization of the pass band um, using band pass calibration, as well as the scaling of arbitrary correlate accounts to fluxes in units of Jansky through flux calibration. Appropriate calibrators must be used to calculate the individual solutions. All calibrators must be point-like sources, since point sources have a constant amplitude and a constant or near-zero phase. A characteristic we will exploit when we, we use calibrators to identify and flag bad data in other presentations. Complex gain or phase calibration solutions to correct the atmosphere and instrumental effects require data from secondary calibrations. Although they are point-like sources, they must be close to the science target in order to estimate the local conditions. Generally, we choose them about 15 degree radius from the target. Luckily, there are many point-like radio sources scattered across the sky, and many are relatively well isolated from other confusing sources. But not so common are primary calibrators. These calibrators are called primary calibrators since they are known standard sources and they are used to det determine the time independent quantities such as band pass calibration, where the band pass calibrator is required to be a source with a known spectrum over a wide frequency range, and a flux calibrator, which has to be a strong compact source with a known flux to convert our correlator units to Janskys. Conceptually, calibration solves for each Jones matrix starting on the left with the K or delay cor uh, correction matrix, followed by B, band pass, and G, complex gain. As each solution is calculated, it is temporarily applied to the calibrator to correct the distortion before calculating the next Jones matrix. This is done inherently in CASA, as you will see from the CASA calibration commands in our presentation. So the standard file structure used in radio astronomy data processing is a measurement set or MS. And since we will see and since we will be using the CASA software package for our tutorial exercises, the code snippets displayed will be typical CASA commands. One of the first things we generally do starting our calibration routine is to use the set Jansky CASA task to fill the model column in the MS for the calibrator. As we will see a little later, the complex gain calibration function GainCal is used to calibrate out the time variation of phase and amplitude, but GainCal assumes one Jansky point source. In the case when we have a resolved calibrator, such as the planet Titan for flux calibration, we don't want to calibrate out the phase and amplitude variations coming from the extension of the object. And our strategy therefore is to have the model visibilities in the model column for set, uh, set before gain cal divides the data by the model. Conveniently, set Jansky has models for most planets and moons, as well as some well-known calibrator sources. And if your calibrator is not in the already existing list, it's easy enough to manually add using set Jansky. Since an interferometer consists of an array of antennas whose output signals get correlated, Maximum coherence will occur when all these signals are in sync and arrive from all the antennas at the same time. But through the Fourier relation of the measurements, small delays in arrival time between the antenna signals will cause phase errors in the correlated data. And these small deviations will show up as a time constant linear phase slope as a function of frequency in the correlated data for a single baseline. If the frequency channels of an observation are averaged into a continuum image, an uncorrelated de delay 
will cause decorrelation of the continuum signal. It is thus important that all delays in the system be corrected to prevent a reduction in the interferometer amplitude response, thereby, redu thereby reducing our image quality. Contributors to these delays between signals include the atmosphere, different cable lengths, path delays, geometric delays, as well as inaccurate antenna positions and timing errors. Cable delays for the Meerkat telescope are computed by observing a bright calibrated target prior to the start of observations. These global delay values align the data from the different antennas to a single timestamp. But variations still occur due to daily temperature changes, among other things, that will cause these measured delays to drift during the course of an observation. These drifts in the delay are relatively easy to calibrate since the drift will cause the known phase slope on any calibrator as a function of frequency, which we can then correct for by simply rotating or flattening the phase slope. In general, solving for the residual delay errors using a primary or bandpass calibrator is the first step in our calibration algorithm. And the calculated cross polarization phase offset caused by these delays are applied to the data through the Jones K matrix. Inspecting the delay solutions, you should expect all the delays to be within a few nanoseconds per antenna per polarization channel. You may even want to check the passband with the delay solution applied to confirm that we have no more fringing. Deviation in the amplitude and phase response as a function of frequency independent of the delays also occur and has to be corrected through band pass calibration. Since the band pass captures the frequency dependent sensitivity across the observed frequency range, leaving the pass band uncorrected causes incorrect relative amplitude and phases and does not deliver the correct spectral rep representation of the sky. Averaging these uncorrected impurities over frequency into a continuum image limits the achievable signal to noise and therefore dynamic range. Applying the band pass calibration solution correct for these complex gains as a function of frequency or channel across the pass band. To achieve good results in both spectral line and continuum observation, the delay and pass band shapes have to be calibrated. An optional rule of thumb is to stabilize our time varying components before calculating the band pass calibration solutions. To do this, we simply do a throwaway phase calibration. We use here only selected channels in a part of the band that we know is clear of RFI and relatively flat, and apply this temporary gain calibration along with the delay calibration before we apply and calculate the band pass calibration solution. The temporary complex gain solution for the band pass calibrator is found using GainCal. Here, the solution interval is for us a crucial parameter. Various solution intervals have been investigated but in general, the best solution interval at this stage of calibration is to use an interval equal to the time spent on our band pass or flux calibrator to ensure enough SNR. To verify the band pass calibration solution, you can apply the calibrated correction to the calibrator itself and view the data over time and frequency. For a point source, the time average phase should be close to zero over frequency. And for a continuum source, the time average amplitude should be constant over frequency. Everything else antenna-based that leads to amplitude and phase changes are often time-dependent, and the antenna gain calibration tracks these variable properties, which are mostly due to changes in conditions of the atmosphere and instrument. The largest time-varying contributions are water vapor due to cloudy days, shattering from other antennas due to observing geometry and other occasional phenomena like solar flares, broadcasting satellites, tourist cell phones and digital cameras. Some of these can be calibrated and corrected for, and using gain calibration, this can be done. But referring to the RFI, such as the cell phones and digital cameras, those unfortunately we cannot correct for, and those need to be flagged out on a practical level. It should be noted that while the delay and band pass calibration solutions are slow varying and calculated using only primary calibrators, the time dependent complex gain correction requires a calibrator that is close to the science target. 
the observation of this phase calibrator is interdispersed with the target observation, with the calibrator source pair typically within 15 degrees radius, as we mentioned before. As a consequence, gain or secondary calibrators may not be as tight a point source, and they may be resolved or slightly partially resolved. This may require you to image them first to create a model before you can use them in the calibration. So lastly, to calibrate the target flux density, we know that the visibility amplitude for point sources are proportional to the source intensity. This means that the observed visibility of a correlator with a known flux density can be rescaled during calibration to obtain its true flux density at the observed frequencies. The flux density scale adopted by Meerkat is based on the Perley and Butler standards that provide flux densities for a number of sources between 1 and 50 GHz. The CASA flux scale task performs the bootstrapping and calculation of the scale factor for us, which can then be applied to all sources in our observation, including the science target with an unknown flux, to obtain the sky flux density. So often it is a good idea to apply calibration to our calibrators themselves to verify the calibration solutions. So here we would check that everything has actually truly proceeded as well as we would like. And this is also a good time to just look at our calibrated data using PlotMS. A very useful way to check the goodness of calibration is to plot the, the corrected amplitude versus corrected phase of a primary calibrator which should look like a tight ball for a point source. If there is a structured source, like a resolved source, the, uh, the plot of corrected amplitude versus corrected phase will also show organized structure. We can also inspect the corrected amplitude versus baseline, which should be flat for a point source, and will re reveal any lingering antenna-based problems. For unresolved sources, we can also plot corrected amplitude versus UV distance, since we expect the amplitude to be flat across all UV distances for our calibrated sources. Note, this is not necessarily true for our target source. Then after applying all our calibration solution to the science target, we may want to examine the calibrated visibility data for the calibrated science target, in case there are some more bad data to flag out. Remember, do not re reapply calibration to the, your science target after, uh, after flagging. This round of flagging is merely for cleaning and imaging, not for calibration. So one advantage we have with antenna-based calibration solutions is that they can be applied even um, without all the baselines. But calibrators are observed at a different time and position in the sky than the target. So after transferring the calibration solution onto the science target, there may still be some residual errors in the data. Self-calibration helps to correct for residual amplitude and phase errors, as well as some direction-dependent effects. Self-calibration will be explained in detail during a later presentation, but the basic algorithm for self-calibration is apply the standard calibration solution and make your first image of the target. Use the image target as a model to calibrate the data over some time solution interval. Apply the obtained self-calibration solution and make a new image of your, of your target. Repeat the second and third steps until there is no major improvement in your image quality or SNR. In general, we find self-calibration improves the RMS noise in the final image. So we see that there are many effects including the atmosphere, delay error and the electronics of the receiver system that will corrupt the signal from our science target. Your science goal will be affected by the if the observational data cannot be properly calibrated. Standard calibration techniques using bright, simple sources can eliminate most of these effects. And the measurement equations are useful framework for understanding errors and for determining calibration parameters. Additional techniques such as self-calibration can also be applied to remove residual errors, but here you have to make sure that you have sufficient signal-to-noise ratio, enough baseline, and an accurate model of your source. In general, each telescope will have staff astronomers who are familiar with the instrument as well as the data processing strategies that are most successful. If you are new to Mirka data processing, it is well worth your time to read the user documentation on calibration strategies published by the Soreo Service Desk. So closing off, 
To put our knowledge into practice, some tutorial notebooks to practice inspecting and calibrating radio astronomy data can be found in the workshop cookbook on GitHub. And with that, I thank you.